Thank you, Chairwoman Jackson Lee, for holding this hearing today and to all of our witnesses for being here. Executive clemency can be an important tool in our justice system. However, as so many have attested today, the current process could use some work. Um, I had the privilege to participate in the Clemency Project 2014, an effort led jointly by the then White House, the Department of Justice, and a host of groups across the ideological spectrum to grant relief to nonviolent offenders who've been subjected to mandatory minimum sentences, which we've since moved away from. In that project, we trained hundreds of private bar lawyers across the country and joined them in screening thousands of case files and filing hundreds of clemency petitions on behalf of individuals who met a rigorous criteria for consideration. And I was really pleased that the team at my law firm obtained clemency for 29 individuals. And I think their stories can help inform this conversation and dispel some of the rhetoric and fears about releasing dangerous individuals into the community. One of them was Michelle Miles, who was jointly represented by my former law firm and NYU students under the supervision of Professor Barco. Um, another was Cindy Shank, whose story was the basis for an award-winning 2018 documentary, The Sentence, which provides an in-depth look on the incredible impact that clemency can have. But I also know that thousands of clemency applications were left unaddressed when President Obama left office with his successor choosing to prioritize clemency and pardons for his personal associates and individuals recommended by social media influencers using no discernible objective criteria other than political expediency. So I understand that our current process can be burdensome, inefficient, and both underutilized and subject to abuse. So it sounds like there are ways we can improve the clemency process and ensure that the president can effectively implement this important tool. So Professor Barco, um, yesterday I joined Congresswoman Presley and two of our Republican colleagues, Representatives Joyce and Armstrong, in a letter to the pardon attorney requesting disaggregated demographic data on the clemency application backlog so that we can better understand its impact on communities. We know there are currently over 17,000 pending clemency petitions stuck in that backlog. Can you give us a sense of who the applicants caught in the backlog are? And do many of them meet the criteria for clemency established by the last couple administrations? So I'll, I'll answer that to the best that I can, but it's not a very transparent process, which is one of the problems, is we don't really know um, because the pardon attorney doesn't give very much information about what the petitions look like. But what I can tell you is there are thousands of people who would not be serving the sentences they're serving today because the law itself has changed and Congress did not make the changes retroactive, for example, in the First Step Act, um, other than making crack cocaine changes retroactive, all the other changes to mandatory minimums are just forward looking only. So there's a lot of people who are serving sentences that wouldn't get the sentences they have today. Similarly, they wouldn't have gotten the sentences they have today because they were sentenced under mandatory guidelines and they didn't get covered by the Obama initiative. So there's, we know there's, Thousands, I can't give you a precise amount. I can tell you the Sentencing Commission did a report after the Obama initiative and found that there were you know, thousands of people who met his criteria who just kind of escaped uh, review under that process. Um, the other thing we know is there's just thousands, we don't, again, I don't know the precise number, I've tried to get it from BOP, this committee could get it, uh, who have been released under the CARES Act. So they're already released under home confinement. Attorney General Bill Barr released them, um, but they will go back to prison uh, if the pandemic is declared over, if the emergency is over, unless they get clemency relief. They were a big chunk of the people who got the grants from President Biden in his, uh, in those 75. Um, so that's another large group of people that's in there. Um, and then we have a lot of people who are serving sentences under mandatory minimums. To go back to Representative Gohmert's point, those judges had no authority to give that sentence. Their hands were tied. And many of those judges would very much like to see those people get clemency because they actually weren't the product of a judge looking at individual circumstances and facts. They were mandatory minimums that the prosecutor brought and they were triggered by the conviction or the plea. That's it, you know, the judge couldn't do anything about it. So th those are some of the the people that are in that pool. They have families, they have loved ones, they've served their time, they have performed. They, many of them, like Mr. Underwood, have you know unblemished records that are very hard to have while someone is incarcerated, and they're just looking for a chance to get a second chance and show that they're no threat to public safety. Well, I share your concerns that the White House and DOJ lack the resources to tackle the backlog and be more efficient moving forward, and that there's a potential for conflict of interest within the DOJ. 
Can you just speak very briefly about how the Pardon Advisory Board could assist with that? The gentle lady's time has expired. Okay, uh, Madam Chair, I just would request unanimous consent to enter into the record an article from Nation of Second Chances detailing the experience of Michelle Miles, who received clemency from President Obama in 2016. Without objection, so ordered, and the gentle lady uh, witness can provide the answer in writing. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I recognize.